Our next speaker is right from Massachusetts. Dr. Phyllis Mullenix started her career at the University of Kansas with a PhD in pharmacology with a specialty in neurotoxicology. She completed a postdoctorate at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health in Environmental Medicine. In 1977, she joined the Department of Psychiatry at Children's Hospital in Boston and joined the Department of Neuropathology with Harvard Medical School. From there, she moved to Forsyth Dental Research Institute and was the head of the Department of Toxicology for 11 years. In 1995, she published the groundbreaking study linking fluoride with damage to the central nervous system. Currently, Dr. Mullenix is a research associate at Children's Hospital Department of Psychiatry and lecturer in radiation oncology at Harvard Medical School. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Phyllis Mullenix. I want you to know I was born and raised in Missouri, the show me state. I talk a little slower, and so I think I ought to have a little longer to talk because it takes me longer to get it out. <laughs> yes, I want to tell the story of how I was introduced to fluoride. I will tell you the truth. Fluoride never even entered my thoughts before 1982. I was at Children's Hospital. I, my specialty was I was to develop animal models to, screen, uh, to look at and develop technology that would screen for screen substances for having an adverse effect upon the brain and uh, behavior. In the process of doing that, um, I drew the attention of Dr. Jack Hine, who was the director of the Forsyth Dental Center in Boston. It's right next to the Museum of Fine Arts, if you're not familiar with it. It's an old institution that uh, used to provide free dental care for all the children of Boston. Dr. Hyde wanted me to come to Forsyth because he wanted me to, to apply the new technology that we were working on to dental products. And he was suspicious that many of the dental products were causing a problem for the brain and he wanted me to come and to develop the new computer system that we were uh, in the process of working on. It was to be a brand new system that would totally uh, make screening for neurotoxicity an objective measure. Uh, I'm going, to, if they can turn down the slides, I'm going to, or turn down the lights so we can see the slides. I'm not trying to get you into the science, I'm just trying to get you to realize what was going on. We developed the first computer pattern recognition system where a computer actually did what the eyeball would do in terms of looking at uh, behaviors. This computer system, we, we got the first VAC system and it was totally dedicated to doing nothing but following the movements of animals and being able to pick out abnormal behavioral patterns. So I moved then to Forsyth, I agreed uh, to come and to uh, set the system up and I also agreed that this system would be applied to fluoride as the first thing that we would study. When I moved to Forsyth, Dr. Jack Hine introduced me to what was known as the, the world's leading expert on fluoride chemistry and fluoride toxicology. That individual's name was Dr. Harold Hodge. Dr. Harold Hodge is one of the founding fathers of the Society of Toxicology. Dr. Hodge also was the chief pharmacologist on the Manhattan Project. And it was his responsibility to uh, look at the toxicology of fluoride, although I didn't know that at the time. Then um, uh, I, I worked on the computer system at, at Forsyth. We developed, we had our laboratory, we had our video cameras, we had the computers going. It took a lot of years. The system was successfully set up. Uh, you know, it was the first system, as I said, where human intervention in doing these tests was totally taken out. So it was an objective measure. 
And then we, um, I had a physicist that worked with me, Dr. William Kernan, who was the head physicist at the uh, Ames Laboratory. And um, in fact, he designed the programs to follow the movements of hydrogen particles through a bubble chamber. And he says, well, if we can follow hydrogen particles through a bubble chamber, we can follow rats through three-dimensional space. We took this system, we developed it, and we applied it to fluoride. Now, um, I must say that in what this computer, this is a digitized picture of what the computer sees. And so I'm just pointing this out because, as I say, this was a, a very unique system. And I was sought out by many different groups to apply this system to many different, neuro, many different substances that were suspected. And the one that we developed that was most successful was in um, the look at the neurotoxicity of the treatments for our childhood leukemia. And uh, our system was put into the uh, yearbook of oncology, and we were very successful. Then we applied it to fluoride, and uh, we found some very suspicious results. We published this paper in 1995. Uh, it's not very clear. I'm so sorry, the, the, maybe the lights are a little too bright. Can we dim the lights a little? Anyway. We found some very suspicious results. We published this in a peer-reviewed journal in neurotoxicology and teratology. I reported the results to Dr. Jack Hine, the director of the institute. He got very excited. He says, we must fly to Washington and present this to the National Institute of Dental Research. He says, we also need to report it to certain industries, which I proceeded and I did. I submitted a grant to the National Institutes of Health in 1992 to look at this. I gave a seminar at my institution, for, um, Foresight, and I was <laughs> meted with, met with some reaction from the uh, uh, so senior members of the staff that they were very concerned. They were afraid that their money from uh, the National Institute of Dental Research would be taken away if I published this information. Anyway, the paper came out. They, uh, it was, um, they Forsyth notified the National Institute of Dental Research uh, prior to it, and they asked me to do a television conference on this before my information came out. They wanted to see what we were saying. In 1994, I left Forsyth and chairman of, uh, of that department, or head of the toxicology department. Then um, what I found in that study were three basic conclusions. There was no question that behavior was vulnerable to fluoride. Whether you got a very short exposure, and this in animals, if, you, if, you're, if they're young, if it's prenatal, or if it's early postnatal, all you needed was two or three days exposure to this. And it caused a permanent change in behavior when the animals grew up. That's all the exposure. If you took all the, way, all the other exposures away, and they got none other but that one exposure, that was it. It was enough to permanently change their behavior. Now, um, also in that study, we found that the effects varied with age. If you were prenatally exposed, it was hyperactivity was the problem. If you were ex exposed as adults or at weanlings, we called it the couch potato. The problem was is that they, uh, they, they were hypo hypoactive and very slow. Also, we found that the um, fluoride accumulated in the brain. And this is very different than what the literature had said before. Because the literature had shown before, uh, but they didn't do it appropriately, they said that it does not get into the brain and it does not accumulate. And we know that that is wrong. And this is just to show you some levels, for example, of control and exposed female in the hippocampus of the brain. Uh, some of the areas are, are it's doubling and tripling in actual amount of fluoride in those regions of the brain. So we knew we were in trouble. The paper came out, and um, I started getting response from all over the world. And that's when I started learning that there's more to this fluoride story than just that it's good for your teeth. I, I got more information because I was upsetting people by saying this. And I learned that fluorine is a natural element. It is in, pre in a lot of different things. It's more common than chlorine and nitrogen, or as common as chlorine and nitrogen. And it's more common than carbon, even. And because it's so ubiquitous, that assures that you are going to be exposed to fluoride, whether it's in your drinking water, whether it's through the air, whether it's uh, uh, 
you know, via food or soil, you're still going to get exposures to fluoride. The other thing that was concerning was there are a lot of occupations out there that you are being exposed to fluoride to whether you know it or not. If you work with aluminum, if you work with magnesium, if you work with any petrochemical, if you are in coal production, if you work in a glass factory or a brick factory or a tile factory, all of these will assure that you are going to be exposed to fluoride. You absorb it through your skin, you can inhale it. And to your body, it doesn't matter where this fluoride is coming from, your drinking water or, what, or wherever it's coming from, to your body, it's the same thing. I found that fluoride is at the hazardous waste sites, the EPA's national priorities list. Yes, it's a pesticide, as mentioned before. And then I found that fluoride is used to process uranium and it was used to produce atomic energy. And so this really concerned me because I didn't realize, coming from a dental institution, I thought that fluoride was only coming from drinking water. I really didn't realize that when I drank a Coke, when I drank Snapple tea, when I drank grape juice, that I was really adding to my body burden of, of fluoride with all these others. So I thought this was important enough to submit another grant in 96. And the information, they were still a little scared about this, and they said, gee, there doesn't seem to be a link between the brain or bone problems. I don't see how this could be possible. And then in walked Cliff Honecker into my life, and he walked, and he says, he asked me two questions. I'd never met or heard from this before. He knocked on my door in this, this summer, as a matter of fact, in 1996, and he asked two questions. He asked me about my CNS work, and he asked me about my relationship to Harold Hodge. Remember, Hodge was one of the people in my department of toxicology I'd worked with, and he, would work. he was a chief pharmacologist on the Manhattan Project. This man had never said anything to me in all that time. He asked me lots of questions about what we were doing, but he never actually said what was going on. Cliff showed me some documents then from the Manhattan Project that had recently been declassified. I then got a publication from 1949 where this man had been there when they actually started working with the fluoride and did the original toxicology studies. And they described what happened to some of these people when they were accidentally overexposed to fluoride. And here is what he found. All the seriously injured individuals were unusually nervous, apprehensive for four to five days after the accident. One individual was definitely overstimulated for about three days, exaggerating all facial expressions and being unusually verbose and talkative. At times, he was almost incoherent. The other seriously injured patient, although normally quiet and placid, became very apprehensive with a similar tendency toward the exaggeration of statements. The opinion of all observers held that the mental reactions were more than could possibly be explained on a fear reaction basis. The second accident that they had, the mental status for the first five or six days following the accident was marked by general sluggishness, the couch potato syndrome, with transient, transient periods of restlessness, irascibility, and nervous tension with occasional silliness and loss of contact. Does that sound like Dr. anybody you know? Hodge in 1965 wrote another book. This time, though, in that book, all he talked about were the effects of fluoride on bone and teeth. He did not talk about uh, anything about these CNS effects. But then Cliff showed me some documents from 1944. And in this memo, I just want to point out a couple of statements. This memo was marked top se er, secret. And no one knew this, but it, and it's dated April of 1944. And I can't hardly read it from here, but it says, it's to Stafford Warren, who was part of the um, uh, head of the project. And they talk about here that there is clinical evidence to suggest that C616, that's uranium hexafluoride, may have a rather marked central nervous system effect with mental confusion, drowsiness and lassitude as the conspicuous features. It seems most likely that the fluoride component, rather than the uranium, is the causative factor. They knew in 1944 that it was causing a problem. They go on to say here that it's causing a problem and we are worried about it and we want to do animal experimentation because 
these, um, we're, we're afraid that our workers are going to become confused and they're not going to be able to handle working with this stuff. They're going to be a danger to themselves and they're going to be a danger to others. The memo goes on. They set up a budget. They gave money to these people to do the studies in rats that I just did in 1996. They had the budget. It was approved. The Colonel in the Manhattan Project said, yes, go ahead and do it. This, this office approves that these, this experimental program can go forward. Not six months later, another memo comes in and it says, if you started those studies on the mental condition in rats, stop them. And if you haven't started them, don't start them at all. So they knew there was a problem, they stopped it back 50 years ago, and they never did the study, and the studies were never reintroduced into the documents. And you don't see that in the literature today, and that's why you don't see a lot of the dentist who knows the problems with the CNS. Now, going on, since then I've gone to other, liter other literature around the world, and I can tell you in, in a nutshell, you've mentioned the IQ problems, You've mentioned, I can tell you, that uh, there's a review that's recently written, as, as recent as 1994, that says the syndrome that you have if you're exposed looks a lot like the chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, I can go back to the 1950s where these people, uh, they talk about their memory loss, they talk about the problems with coordinating their thoughts. These are documented and they do exist, but you can't find them in the literature in the United States. I had to go outside. I had to wait until someone knocked on my door and showed me declassified documents that these problems were known about some time ago. Then I have to go on. Uh, I see I'm, I'm a little too slow, but one of the last documents I saw that just blew me away, and I said, if I do nothing else, I've got to get out so that the people do have the right to know this. They went out, they had one big accident, or a lot of release of the fluoride. The chief pharmacologist, Harold Hodge, that I worked with, went out and he write, writes a memo about his visit to the site. And he says, there's no question it's hydrogen fluoride. There's no question that uh, the people are sick. There's no question that the fruit is poisoned. There's no question that the, the levels were so high that there had to be an em agricultural embargo on the fruit, which was stopped. There was no question that people were being poisoned. And then he turns around and says, should we try and alleviate the fear of the public about fluoride by telling them it's good for their teeth? So the next time someone comes up and says to you that fluoride is good for your teeth, if I were you, I would just say no. 